as a budding engineer and a social entrepreneur, I love designing the solutions of tomorrow, ranging from inexpensive water filters that remove 95% of contaminants from your water to paper sensors that can detect anything ranging from Alzheimer's to explosives for one one hundred thousandth of a penny. But these solutions to real world problems wouldn't mean as much to me if they weren't designed with the benefit of another human being in mind. However, science often teaches us the exact opposite, portraying that empirical results and logic reign supreme. That's the, that's the end result that matters most. Science created for the sake of science. And I totally get that, because when you're in the lab, it's easy to get caught up with the bubbling test tubes and all that glorious data. However, at the same time, we have to remember not to lose sight of the person who might be able to benefit from our discovery one day. And regardless of what the discovery or the innovation is, we scientists must always remember that the goal of science is to help benefit those other human beings. Otherwise, what's the point of science? And for me, my interest in science was really sparked at a really young age. My parents are both kind of sciencey. My mom's a nurse anesthetist, and my dad's a civil engineer. So they know a thing or two about science. And ever since a young age, when I was like probably starting in kindergarten, whenever me and my brother had a question that had to do with science, my parents would never tell us the answer. They'd be like, go design an experiment and figure it out, which was incredibly frustrating for three-year-old me. I'm like, just tell me the answer. However, even though my scientific curiosity was sparked at a really young age, my passion for scientific research really didn't start until I was about 11, when I was in the sixth grade. And as you can see from my stylish bowl cut and look, science was really the only occupation for me. <laughs> and after I won my first science fair, I was seriously hooked. And I was so hooked, I started working on my next year's science fair project the day after that science fair. And I kind of envisioned myself as this homegrown science champion rock star person. That is until the seventh grade. You see, something mysterious happened over that period from sixth to seventh grade. The unimaginable had occurred. Science and math had gone from super cool to painfully uncool. And over the course of a single summer, my popularity plummeted from first class uh, science and math whiz kid to incredible science dork. And going to math camp that summer certainly didn't help my case. However, what happened then uh, is the bullying started, especially once I came out as gay in eighth grade. And initially it just started with people like yelling, you fag, in the hallway, and I could deal with that. But then once they got bored with that, they add throwing me to the ground and punching me to their bullying repertoire. And my friends in sixth grade, well, in seventh grade, they quickly disappeared, silently afraid that whatever I had might be catching. And so there I was, alone, sad, and completely depressed. And just when I thought things couldn't possibly get worse, my close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And from his diagnosis to his final breath, he lived just three short months. And science had really offered me a kind of like comfort zone before, so I returned to science and the internet for answers. but. What I found really shocked me about pancreatic cancer. You see, 85% of these cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And I was wondering, why are we so bad at attacking these cancers? And as I dug deeper, I found an even more shocking statistic. Our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad. But also it costs $800 per test, and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the disease in order to give you this test. And so, armed with eighth grade biology, I set out to change the face of cancer diagnostics. And my kind of rationale was the current test sucks so much that anything I do will probably be marginally better. So I shut myself in my room that summer and researched just thousands and thousands of proteins, 8,000 proteins. I read all these articles, and it made for some really interesting back-to-school essays. My friends were like, oh, we went to the national park. Jack, what do you do? I research proteins. Always an awkward pause after that. 
They kept going, and finally, on the 4,000th try, I found one protein called mesothelin. That's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. But the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could detect this protein, you could detect the cancer when survival was at its best. But now, of course, the question was, how on earth am I going to detect this thing? And my answer came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. <laughs> Particularly with my biology teacher, we did not get along, so one day tensions rose to record highs, and I decided to rebel how any self-respecting teenager would. I smuggled in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. That would show her some actual science in that class. And so these single-walled carbon nanotubes are some of the coolest things ever. They're these super small tubes of carbon that are an atom thick, and they're 150,000th the diameter of a single strand of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And at the same time, while I had this article kind of like sneakily tucked under my desk, we were reading about these other molecules called antibodies. And antibody, it's like a lock and key. It will only react to one specific protein. In this case, that cancer biomarker I had found. And I was just sitting there when all of a sudden it hit me. You could combine these two concepts, and what you end up with is a network of these nanotubes laced with antibodies, which creates this carbon substance that will only react to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, it will actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate whether or not you have the pancreatic cancer. And making these is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies. Literally, all you do is you just take some water, you pour in the nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry, and you can detect cancer. But then I was like, I'm probably going to need a research lab to do this. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff, like we got put on the FBI watch list for our online shopping history. And we also cultured cholera where we make our sandwiches, but the CDC didn't have to be called in. And also, tragically, the thing with cancer research in your kitchen, my mom would always get in the way when she was making dinner. That was pretty tragic. One time she like put lasagna in like this thing where he was like mixing up nanoparticles, and I accidentally like poisoned my cousin with like titanium dioxide. It was like really bad. But he hasn't died yet. He's doing okay. However, I was like, okay, I'm going to need a lab to do this research. So I contacted 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. I sent out these giant behemoths of documents outlining each and every aspect of my procedure. And I sat back waiting for all these positive emails to pour in. I'd be able to like pick and choose my lab. And then reality struck. I got 199 rejections. I realized professors, aren't nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem online. Some went through my entire procedure saying why it was the worst possible mistake I could ever make and I should just quit science now. However, I kept going and finally got one positive response from Dr. Anirban Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. And I go in for this big interview and as soon as I sit down, he like come, like brings in like 28 PhDs into this like nine foot by nine foot room. We probably set some Guinness Book of World Records there. And they just start firing these questions at me, and I had no clue what they were talking about. My knowledge of cancer biology was a six-month crash course I gave myself using the internet. So I guess C, just like I do on any multiple choice test. And it somehow turned out. Uh, I landed the lab space I needed. And I started slaving away in the lab, and I realized I knew nothing about doing lab work. Like, I'd sneeze in my cancer cells or blow them up in the centrifuge, and it was, like, really bad. Like, my professor was like, why on earth did I ever let you in here? However, after seven months, I finally ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection, but also can detect these cancers in the early stages when survival's at its best, and so far is over 90% accuracy at detecting the cancers. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. 
but it wouldn't stop there. You can simply switch out that antibody and detect an entirely different disease. So you could detect things ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are literally endless. And to think, this all started just because I wanted to understand what had happened to my uncle. It goes to show that the love of one, even after they're gone, can touch many. And this love of helping other people live healthier and longer lives is what really fuels my current scientific research. And currently, I'm revisiting two projects I started back when I was younger, the first of which is regarding these things called bacterial biosensors that I started in seventh grade. And since I was in seventh grade, the results were less than perfect. So armed with my newfound knowledge of sensors, and uh, I decided to like retackle this issue with an adult eye. And so I went out, and I soon developed these series of sensors that cost one one hundred thousandth of a penny, and you, they only take a minute and can be read using your eye or your cell phone, and they can instantly see down to part per trillion levels what contaminants are in your water. So in other words, these sensors are so sensitive they can pick up a single drop of, con of a contaminant in, an Olympic, in 400 Olympic-sized pools worth of water. And now that I could detect these contaminants, I was wondering how on earth am I going to get them out of the water? And my second breakthrough moment came when I was walking in the inner harbor with my friend near my home in Maryland, and I looked out and saw all these bits of trash uh, flowing in the ocean. And I was thinking, I was like looking out, and all of a sudden a crazy thought crossed my mind. What if the problem could become the solution? What if I could use the amazing properties of these plastics, lightweight, cheap, and durable, to form the backbone of a really inexpensive water filter? And so essentially, by attaching amino acids to these water bottles, what you end up with is a filter that will grab and pull out heavy metals and pesticides from the water. And as I developed this, it turned into a filter that costs only 70 cents and can remove 95% of all the contaminants in your water in just five minutes. And for my second project then, I decided to revisit cancer research. And I created this sensor, but now I was wondering how on earth am I going to treat these cancers? And as, as I was doing this research, I found that the vast majority of cancer therapies don't work after a while because the cancer will mutate and form resistance to them. And so my solution to this was by creating these nanorobots that I program using DNA. And they'll actually learn how to treat your cancer, combining five different therapies at different dosages that they calculate while in your bloodstream. And they'll actually evolve with your cancer as it develops resistance, such that it's continuously effective against your cancer. But also, I can have these nanorobots actually tinker with the genetics of your cells. So they can insert genes that would make your cancer cells go green if I want, so a surgeon could see them during a surgery. Or I could knock down certain genes such that your cancer cells are more susceptible to certain treatments. I could essentially reprogram your cells to do whatever I want. And one of the other cool things about these near robots is they're actually made out of iron oxide, which is an excellent MRI contrast agent. And so you can actually visualize the therapy in real time, but also it could be potentially used as a diagnostic. And throughout this journey, I have heard a lot of sayings. One of the ones that I constantly stick with me is how you give is how you live. And so if you're a budding engineer or a social entrepreneur, know that you have the power, and most importantly, the responsibility to design solutions for the greater good of society. What society needs is more talented scientists and engineers who will design those solutions that will benefit another human life, even if you don't know them. And engineering combined with the social entrepreneurship really is the future, and it has to be, because we humans are so closely connected. And considering that connection, isn't it time that we start designing and engineering for the 99% rather than profiting from the needs of the privileged few. And I think that the, at this nexus of these two fields, that's where really true innovation comes from, where you take this informed policy and are able to design solutions for the future. Because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do together. Thank you.